please welcome Peggy Emmel. Hey, Peggy. Hi, Eric. How are you doing today? I'm terrific. What are you going to do for us today? Well, I'm going to teach you how to paint clouds, and I'm wow. going to start that with a little introduction about how I mix colors, give you a, some information about atmospheric perspective, and then give you a step-by-step -step, uh, process for painting clouds, and I'll demonstrate that. Okay, I want to show everybody a little of Peggy's work just so you can get a feel for it, uh, so you know what you're about to get. Peggy lives in New Mexico. Where are you, in Santa Fe? Taos. Taos, I'm sorry. Big yeah. difference, big difference. Yeah. So you, as you can see from these paintings that I'm flipping through, Peggy is masterful at this. And uh, wow, snow. Uh, you have snow now, don't you? We do. It's snowing today, in fact. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Just beautiful distance there. Thanks. So uh, anyway, uh, Peggy, take it away. Okay. Um, Eric, I think, are you going to, you're going to run slides. I am. Me? Yep. And I'll talk a little bit about, uh, first I want to cover how uh, I approach color and that involves color mixing. And then I'll talk a little bit about atmospheric perspective and then give you some tips for painting clouds. And I'll demonstrate those tips. Uh, later in the in the show, so when I think about color, I it I consider that it has four components: hue, value, temperature, and chroma, and that's the hierarchy that I use when I am mixing color. I first consider the hue, then I consider the values, then I consider the temperature, and then I consider chroma. So. Next slide. All right, you might want to explain what some of those terms mean because there are people who, who don't know. So as we go through this. Yes, I will. So hue is actually the color of the color and there are hue families, three primaries, red, yellow, blue, and three secondaries, orange, purple, and green. And there's obviously black and white. Uh, and I guess those are colors, but for our purposes, uh, when we're mixing paint, the first thing we have to consider is what hue family is it part of? And it's one of these six. So okay. we go to the next slide. The second uh, thing to consider when you start mixing color, <clears throat> and of course this is pigment, uh, which is different than light, but... Uh, that's another more complex thing to examine. When you start mixing color, the first thing you do is decide on the hue family. Then it becomes important to decide what value you need. And you do that by looking at your source and deciding from that source what value of the hue you want. You can lighten the value with white. You can darken it with black, although Typically, uh, well, you can darken it with black, but you have to look at the color and decide what value it is. That's a little complicated, uh, and squinting helps to, uh, uh, makes it easier to decide what value a color is. Yellow's a tricky one. Now, value, <laughs> just for everybody's benefit, value means the, the level of darkness or lightness. Right. The uh, uh, higher so in values. That, that might be a grayscale, but that could also be a light yellow to a, you know, to a dark, uh, all, you know, dark, yes. dark yellow or, or it red could. or green or any other, any mixture. It could. It's the, uh, it's the lightness or darkness of the color that you're mixing. And the closer a color is to white, the higher in value it is. And the, uh, closer it is to black, the lower it is. Um, I, you know, I know there are numbers and I always am mixed up on the numbers. I don't know if one is white or one is black, but. Doesn't matter uh, right now. Yeah. Okay, next slide. This will all, if you have any questions, uh, if you see any I'll, questions. I'll read questions out once we get into the painting right. demo area. I think this will all make more sense when you see how it is applied to paintings. So the next thing I consider when I'm mixing a color in the hierarchy is the temperature of the color. And temperature 
is a little bit tricky because the primaries and the secondaries each have an inherent temperature. Each of those colors, blue is cooler than red. However, it's all relative. There can be a blue that is warmer than a cool blue. And a good example of that might be in pigments, uh, cerulean blue as compared to cobalt blue. Cobalt's a colder blue than cerulean. Cerulean's warmer. So when you start thinking about temperature and color mixing, you have to consider uh, how it relates to that the other colors in that painting, and only that painting. That's, that's the whole world, that painting. Um, see if there's anything else I want to say. No, I think that's all. Do you have any questions about that? Nope, keep going. I've got the next okay. slide. The last thing to consider is the chroma. And some people think of chroma as saturation. The, I think the technical term is chroma. Um, chroma, a bright color, a pure color has the highest chroma. And you can decrease the chroma of any color by uh, a, few, a number of ways. You can add white to it. That will decrease the chroma and make it duller. You can add black to it, that will make it duller, or you can add the complement. And that's a common way to decrease the chroma in a color. Can in you painting. explain to everybody what a complement means? A complement, uh, if you look at a color wheel, the complement is the color on the color wheel that's, the, that's opposite on the color wheel from a given color. So for example, I'm going to come on and I'm, I'm just going to come on and show a, hang color, on a second. Wheel? color wheel. Yeah. All right. So this is a color wheel. Great. All right. So you're getting a, a reflection on it. I apologize. When you, you look at that color wheel, uh, the, the colors are distributed around the wheel. And the color that is opposite uh, a color on the color wheel is its complement. So for example, the complement of blue, which is in your, yeah, that's purple, but let's use purple. The complement of purple is yellow. It's opposite on the color wheel. And typically the complement of a color is made up of the other two primary colors. For example, if yellow is the color you're trying to find the complement of, if you mix uh, red and blue, you'll get purple. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna so, like, get back to your slides all now. Right. So <laughs> that, those are the, uh, those are the four things I consider when I'm mixing color, and I do it in that order. I find the hue family. I try to mix the proper value. I try to then add uh, whatever I need or subtract whatever I need to find the proper temperature. And I might add a complement to get the uh, proper chroma. So when you're, when you're painting, uh, this is all nice and it's all theory. When you're painting, the pigments you use matter uh, and they will affect how each of these colors behaves. So I recommend when, you're, when you start at least that you pick, uh, you pick some paints and stick with them for your, what I consider your painting palette. I like to use a what's called a split primary or a warm cool primary. And that is, I use a warm yellow, a cool yellow, and that's relative to each other. <clears throat> it could be any, any two yellows you want, as long as one is warmer and one is cooler. So warm yellow, cool yellow, warm blue, cool blue, warm red, cool red. Um, you wanna consider uh, the quality of the paint, is it transparent, is it an opaque paint? Um, the color scheme, that, that affects how you'll mix colors. 
But the most important thing is to remember that when you're mixing colors for a painting, it's all about that painting. It's not about anything else. Anything off the painting doesn't matter. It's just that painting. It's all relative to what's on the canvas. So the result is you compare every time you put a color down on the canvas, you compare it. And th this is what I ask myself. It's a kind of a mantra. Is it, is it light enough? Is it dark enough? Is it warm enough? Is it cool enough? Is it bright enough? Is it dull enough? If you do that, it will guide you in color mixing. So <clears throat> all of that it is, uh, affects atmospheric perspective. And I want to talk a bit about how atmospheric perspective impacts each of these variables. Each of these is a color variable. Uh, there are hue effects, value effects, temperature effects, and chroma effects. So let's go to hue effects. Because that's the first thing you do is you pick the hue. Am I in the right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you look, <clears throat> when you're painting uh, a landscape, the thing to always remember is there is a thing that I call hue dropout. The closest things to you have yellow in them. As, as the distance increases, the light, I guess it's the wavelengths of the yellow drop out and you're left with only red and blue. That's why hey, you Gar get per if, if I could just interrupt for a second, I guess I think this will help some clarity for people who might not understand this concept. If you look at that mountain all the way in the back, if you were standing on that mountain, you would see these trees and these colors exactly as they are here in the foreground. So what you're seeing is everything in that picture are these colors, but because of the uh, consider it a piece of, uh, you know, it's rain droplets or water droplets or distance or almost consider it layers of glass uh, where it gets further and further back. That's what will help help understand that. Right. Atmosphere filters out the wavelength of lights and it happens in the sequence and it's the same sequence every time. The first wavelength that drops out is yellow. That leaves you red and blue, which can create purple. The next thing that drops out, the next wavelength that drops out is red, and that leaves you blue. And eventually blue drops out and you have a kind of a pale white color. There's one exception to this, and that is that sometimes light clouds and, and when, the, when the sky is light, is, appears light, atmosphere pollution will color it a slight yellow. So that's something that you can use, uh, and it does happen. Uh, you'll see it if you look at great distances. But for the most part, just always remember, get rid of the yellow first, then the red, then the blue. Okay. Now, what, about, what, what about when you see clouds? Like, sometimes you'll see clouds where, you know, the clouds are really, really yellow, but they're pretty far away. Well, that's because of the atmospheric pollution. And that's what I'm saying is that a light color like white in a cloud will become yellower as it moves away from you because of pollution. Okay. All right. Um, and you can see that. So the next thing, uh, the next effect of atmosphere on Val is the, ap <laughs> sorry, the next thing that's affected that you should consider is the value. What happens to the value of colors? What, what effect does atmosphere have on that? And it has uh, basically two effects on the value. Objects get lighter because uh, I guess less wavelengths are coming toward you. And there's less contrast between those objects. And I've used this one, uh, this painting, so you can see behind the trees that uh, everything is getting considerably lighter. I think that was a rainy day, so that, that increased that effect. But that happens, lighter and less contrast between objects. So next, uh, atmosphere has an effect on the temperature of color. So we're still following that hierarchy. 
of uh, what hue family is it? What, what is the value? Now the temperature, consider temperature. This little sketch was done at Grand Canyon last September when, when there were all those fires. And um, what basically happens is that as the yellow drops out and then the red, the appearance is that things get cooler in the distance. And I thought this showed that quite well. And again, you can see the yellow in the sky from the pollution. So it's, that's a pretty standard thing that people know that right. it gets cooler as you move back. Okay, next. Um, <clears throat> one that I personally have struggled with sometimes is the effect of atmosphere on chroma uh, or saturation. There's a considerable decrease in the saturation of a color as it moves back. These are three moving targets, value, temperature, and chroma, and they're all decreasing as the distance from you increases. So atmosphere affects all three of those things. Um, the mountains are, the color's less saturated. Uh, it moves more to a neutral gray, even though it's getting cooler, it's getting lighter. So I guess that's, uh, do you have any questions about that part? I, uh, I don't, and I'm right now I'm not going into comments and questions because of the slides, but I have another slide here. Yep. So when you're, when you're painting, this is what you consider with color. Uh, consider the quality of the pigments you're using. Are they transparent? Are they opaque? And use whatever palette you're using for a while so you begin to understand how they behave when you mix them. Uh, if, you have, if you're going to have a color scheme, if you're going to plan a color scheme, that's great. I think it's really helpful to do that. If you're painting a green scene, for example, that's a lot of green, sometimes a little touch of a complement red will help that. So consider the color scheme. Consider the relativity of the color to what is in the painting. Uh, and the example I would use is a warm green. I've got a little drawing there. A, a warm green in one painting, there's a cool green and a warm green on the left. Uh, the warm green might become the cooler pigment in a different painting. I didn't, couldn't find a yellow green, but I used yellow. So it's all relative when we talk about temperature. And then this, this series of questions, I think you should always ask yourself, is it light enough? Is it dark enough? Is it warm enough? Is it cool enough? Is it bright enough? Is it dull enough? If you just keep asking those questions when you're mixing color, you'll find it easier and more systematic uh, it's a more systematic way to uh, move into color mixing. All right. So you want the slide. next slide? Yep. So how how does all of this apply to clouds? Because that's where we started. Um, I think that uh, clouds are a great uh, are a great subject for examining color temperature. Uh, obviously, the things I'm going to talk about here. Uh, there are always exceptions. So uh, if you say, well, I saw the cloud and it, it didn't behave like that, well, that's possible. But typically when I'm painting a cloud, I mix two grays. I mix a, a warm gray and a cool gray. And uh, I use the Hue family blue. I mix them up. I try to get close to the right value. I try, I consider the temperature. I have a warm and a cool. And I dull them down a little bit with, uh, I use blues a lot, so I might dull it down with an orange to, to decrease the chroma on it. So the bottom of most clouds, if you observe them, has, is a very cool gray. And then as the belly of the cloud rolls up, it becomes warmer to a very light, uh, kind of a, almost a white gray. And then there'll be a very warm white on the sunny side of the cloud. So it's a system uh, to use, and there's great variety in clouds. So as long as you follow that system, you can then incorporate the variety 
And you don't have to think every time, how should I start this? You just start with the cool, move to the warm, and then the light. Uh, as the other thing about clouds is as they move into the distance, they get closer together. Uh, just like anything like railroad ties or fence posts. They, they follow the rules of linear perspective. And the other thing I always have to tell myself is that clouds are actually vapor. So they're, they're not solid objects. <laughs> That's sometimes hard to uh, capture when you're painting them. Well, we need, we need to get you painting some clouds. Great. I drew this out last night so that I wouldn't have to spend time doing that. I'm First thing I'm going to do is lay in the darkest dark part of this painting. And I'm using three greens. I'm, I've taken sap green. Can you see this? Well, taken sap green and I've mixed it with raw sienna and transparent oxide red and ultramarine blue. So I have a warm dark, a cool dark, and a, a warm but transparent light. Uh, raw sienna is pretty transparent. So I'm just going to lay that in quickly. One of the things to think about when you start a painting, one of the first things to think about is <laughs> where is the sun coming from? Because that will help you to decide what part of a plant or a tree, for example, should be warmer, what part should be cooler. So, so I'm, my sun is coming from the upper left. Does it look like upper left on your screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is pretty transparent. I'm laying it in pretty transparent. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention is that on my palette here, I've mixed my cool gray for the clouds <clears throat> and also to use for the painting. And that cool gray is made up of ultramarine and orange and white. Okay. And then I took a bunch, I made a huge pile of that. And I took part of that pile and I turned it into a warm gray by mixing raw sienna with it and a little more orange and a little more white. So I have my warm gray, my cool gray, and I mixed a couple of warm whites, one with uh, yellow ochre and white, it's titanium white, and one with cad medium. And why you always pre mix like that, or is this are you that organized? Yeah, I do. What that way, I don't have to think, I don't interrupt the painting flow with the mixing. However, I'm going to do something right now, and I haven't pre mixed it. Uh, I'm going to mix the color of the sage here. The other, I'm going to lay in this distant. Now, keep in mind the atmospheric dark. perspective that Peggy talked about. So that's less dark and less yellow in the back there, right? Yes, it is. I'm using blue. I've added just a touch of my cool gray to it, but I still want to keep it pretty dark. Okay. Hey, hello to Honduras. Nice to have you here. Pakistan, uh, British Columbia. Um, gosh, people from all over the world today. Thank you very much for tuning in. India. I'll shout them out from time to time, Peggy. Oh, great. All right, I'm taking that cool gray that I mixed up in advance, and I'm going to use it for um, a dis distant mountain here. All the, uh, if you look at that, will mean that all the, all the yellow is out. That's not quite, not quite dark enough for me for that. I'm going to put a little cobalt blue in it. Why do you use yellow as your uh, your lines? Just curious. Orange? Well, you know, I have to tell you, it's a you don't have it's to a tell security me. issue. <laughs> I started out using an orange underwash 
for warmth. Yeah. I think it adds warmth. And you're and painting on what kind of a panel? This is a, the panel is a Clausen's 13 uh, linen prime. I okay. love it. Um, and it's, it's mounted on gator board. So All right. I'm, Who makes those? Um, I think Raymar makes them. This is single prime. This one is made by Source Tech. Um, I want to add a little bit of red to that mountain. It's not feeling quite right. Okay. The other thing I want to be sure not to do, this is a rosemary brush. I love these, is have this bush on the... Uh, left be shaped exactly like the bush on the right um, it's easy to do that i think i i was an architecture major in college and worked in that field for a while so i kind of have an engineering mindset and when things don't line up i think my brain just keeps trying to make them the same all right hello norway and south africa what kind of palette is that? Is that a strata palette? You know, this is the, yes, it is. It's the, uh, I can't remember the exact name of it. Uh, I think it's. It's one that mounts on a tripod. I mean, you just lay it in the legs of the tripod. It, well, no, yeah, you do. And this one, this particular one is the, um, is the one that ha you have a staff. So, you know, like a vertical post. Yeah. So you can actually, um, you can paint bigger paintings as opposed to the one that where you put the painting on the lid. I don't know the difference in the name. Yeah. Yeah. Push odd box. Okay. Okay. So I want to put in the uh, sage color also. And I have a kind of a personal favorite for doing that of cerulean blue. I like to mix cerulean and cobalt blue with raw sienna and yellow ochre. Um, I think I'm an inherently lazy painter. So I like to use uh, pre-mixed colors and then alter them. Rather than start with just red and yellow and blue and try to come up with it. Cerulean is pretty close. You'll see here. I'm putting it in fairly dark. And I'm just scrubbing it in. And now I'm going to take a paper towel and scrub that in. How much time do I have, by the way? Uh, you've got about 25 minutes. Okay. I'm going to scrub this in and get to the, uh, try to go ahead and get to the clouds, because that's why we're here. But this will be a sense of the values. I've lightened that a little. The reason I'm using the paper towel is these marks will actually look like bushes. Yeah, scrubby. Yeah, I'll, co I'll go over them with more opaque colors. Hey, Peggy, I've got, I've got to mention something to everybody because I forgot, but uh, okay. uh, the winner of the value specs from yesterday is Betty K. Lewis from North Carolina. Give her a round of applause. She will now see perfect values when she's painting. Uh, today's prize will be a digital subscription to Plein Air Magazine, which has got 20% more content than the print magazine. Most people get both. And so if you leave comments, you might be able to win that digital subscription. Also want to tell you guys that uh, just a few days left on the 31st, the Plein Air Salon ends, and you want to get your entries into that. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Oh, I think the value specs are a great idea. You know, um, it's interesting how that works. The red filter filters out. Does it filter out the red? 
Is that what it does? It, it, fil uh, it filters out. I don't know. It, it filters out everything but the red, I think. But well, the, the reason, uh, the reason but what it does is, is it basically reduces it down so you see the values. All right. I'm going to go ahead and put some of these clouds in. Lock them in. And I'm using my dark, cool gray. I'm going to add a little bit of transparent oxide red to that, just to darken it up and dull it down a bit and make it a little different than the uh, mountains there. I'm struggling a little with scrubbing it in because I'm not used to painting to the side of a painting. Yeah, it's kind of hard, isn't it? Yeah. But that's okay. I know people will be understanding. Of course. I like I like to use the brushes. I like to scrub with them. All right. Next, I'm going to come in with some of the warm gray. I don't know if you can see this. I have a I've done this before. I have a little Let's see here. This is a study. Hold it still. Okay. Good. All right. Now we can see it. I also forgot to show your reference image. I guess I could show that too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, anyway, I have this study from having uh, done this painting. I did a large painting of this. And one thing I'm doing as I'm painting is I'm warming this clap this uh, up just a hair. One thing you'll see sometimes that is a little bit different is sometimes there's a very strong bit of sunlight and there'll be a warm bounce from the ground up on the underside of a cloud. But typically, um, typically the cloud goes from cool on the bottom to warmer to light, white, light, warm, white. But if you are getting that reflected light from the bottom, you just store that underneath your cool. You do. You can just add it in there. Yeah. So I'm, I find it easier to paint if I have a system that I can fall back on. I don't want to use it to make everything the same, but I like having the system. And that's right. why I have those questions that I ask. Is it light enough? Is it dark enough? It looks dark enough to me. Hello, United Kingdom. Uh, somebody said what kind of brushes she's using, rosemary brushes. I'm using rosemary brushes, and these are... Silver Grand Prix. Silver brush, okay. Grand Prix flats. Yeah. For my bristles. And silver, I, uh, silver put some samples in, in our kit at the Adirondacks a year or two ago, and I, I really uh, have started enjoying using those too. I use a lot of, a lot of Princeton's, a lot of rosemary, yeah. a lot of everything. One thing I like, you know, for years I spent a fortune on brushes and um, I buy filberts, I buy flats, I buy brights and it was expensive and then I didn't like them uh. and um, you know I might not like the shape. What I like on this brush is it starts out as a nice flat and then after I grind away on it for a while, it ends up being a nice filbert. And eventually, they end up being like this. Stubs. <laughs> and I, I can use them for scraping. Yeah. <laughs> so I only have to buy one brush in three sizes. Okay. Hello, Nova Scotia. Why I do that. Um. I'm going to put some sky in now. I'm going to mix some cerulean with white over here. 
And it needs to be light enough, light enough, light enough. Put a little yellow in that. So I can use that little sketch I did. I have plastic over it. I can touch on it. I want to get to the fun part, which is where you put the light on. I'm adding a little uh, yellow white in that. If you guys are enjoying this, give a thumbs up or an applause or a heart or something, but also hit the share button so that uh, others can discover this. All right. Looks like you just softened up your sky. I did. That's a rosemary brush. It's a, that flat. Yeah. Rosemary Long, Series 279. They're great brushes. Yeah, they are good brushes. I used to use uh, Mongoose. I heard you say to somebody recently that Mongoose isn't, you can't be. They can't sell Mongoose anymore. No. It's, it's an endangered species, even though they're running wild in Hawaii and, and are a big giant pest. <laughs> are they? Yeah, but you know, uh, yeah. Are they like a weasel? Is that what a mongoose is? You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> but I, I would say this, that uh, if you have mongoose brushes, take good care of them and hold on to them because they do paint differently than anything else. They're great for portrait work. Yeah, really I have soft, a few. Soft. What I did is I took uh, my rosemary mongoose brushes, of which I have many, and I dipped the tips of the brushes in red uh, nail polish. Huh. That way, I just know that I've got to take extra care because it's a rarity. And, and I tell my kids, if they're coming into the studio, they can't use the ones with the red tips. Um, so are they the, you mean you put red on the handles? Uh, yeah, on the mongoose. Yeah. Well, I have some. But you know, the other thing that happens with them is they they came, they would come out, they'd lose their hair. Well, I don't oh. know about that. Yeah. So I think this, this brush that Rosemary's got going, it's a nice substitute for that. So you got about uh, 12 minutes or so. Oh, I better get the, I better get the fun part in. Stop talking and get painting, girl. Yeah. Sorry, I think the presentation went too long. No, uh, it was very valuable. I think it's important to understand about each of these um, components of color. Yeah. And to be able to systematically manipulate them. It's the place it gets difficult is is when we lose track of what needs to be changed and what needs to be altered uh, because it's four moving targets <laughs> hue value temperature chroma and they're all pretty important hey, i just learned something new from uh catherine noel frederick who said someone imported mongoose in hawaii to take care of the rat problem not knowing that rats are nocturnal and mongoose are not <laughs> <laughs> Oops. That's pretty funny. Now they're running wild. So I'm putting this on. You're kind of blocking the camera. There we okay. go. Putting that on with my um, palette. palette knife just to get it thicker. I'm going to do the road last because... I this have trouble with roads, bad. especially if they're in light, you know, to get the color of dirt or the color of the, even the asphalt and make it look right. Yep. Hello, Saudi Arabia. Thank you for tuning in. Maybe somebody could do a demonstration on painting roads. Yeah. Well, I guess that, that's what I should do for a living since that's my name. <laughs> that was pretty funny. 
I like that. Okay, I have a palette knife. I'm putting this light white on. And is that pure white? This is, uh, these are my two warm whites that I mixed. Ochre. I'm go I'll go into a lighter white later, but it's the white with the ochre and the white with the uh, cad yellow. There is clouds are kind of abstract, you know, if you, I guess I should look at my reference a little. Sometimes I'll put reference up so people can see it. Yeah, Clouds sometimes I start I just sort of ignore the reference. I guess we all you know, there's a point at which in a painting when the reference is less important than the painting itself. Well, you're not trying to copy a photograph. Exactly. You're trying to make a piece of art. It's what the painting needs. So I'm using these uh, two warm whites with my two grays, my warm gray and my cool gray. Now I'm going to come in with this brush and work on it. You're going to soften it down? Um, yeah, make it look more brush, make it look more painterly. Right. I'm not, so you, you, used your, you used your palette knife because you wanted to get a lot of paint on there. Exactly. It's a speed thing. Also, I like the accidental quality of things that happen sometimes with a palette knife. You know, when you put something on with a brush and plan it, as in, these are going to be a little rough. Outstanding. So, let's see here. All right. I think you can bring a lot more finish to these. Uh, yep. As you work them, work them. I want to see you paint that road. You don't want to run out of time. Okay. I want to do one more thing though to the clouds. Okay. I'm going to put just a little bit brighter. I'm mixing the color. I should have pre-mixed everything. Well, hey, you can't be I'm perfect. I'm thinking, I'm always thinking temperature here. I'm thinking warmer, warmer. Can you, there's a lot of yellow in that. Hope you guys are enjoying this today. Somebody, Deborah says, I wish I could paint rough and fast, especially painting from the side. You know, <laughs> it, it, it'll get, you'll get there. You know, you got right. you have to learn to lose yourself and not noodle everything perfectly. The road. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you that the best training for painting loose and fast is watercolor. And oh, well, that's right. Uh, because I always use, when I used to paint in watercolor more often, I used to liken it to writing bareback. Yeah. <clears throat> you... You have a plan, but then you kind of have to go. Whoops. Whoops. I think we, I think I'll need to move that back in, huh? Yeah. There. Well, our big watercolor conference starts tomorrow. We've got uh, 30, 39 or 40 countries signed up and uh, almost 1,700 people attending. Where It's the largest art conference in the world. That's terrific. Well, they're going to learn a lot. And I think watercolor is one of the great mediums. Can you still see everything okay, or did I? Yeah, we're, we're cool. Okay. All right. I'm going to get to the road. All right. Let's do it. I'm using transparent oxide red, which I I don't know if this is a good reference, but it's kind of like crack. 
<laughs> you know, it's it's so a wonderful, wonderful color. It's hard to quit using it. I used it instead of uh, burnt sienna. I'm mixing a little gray with that using raw sienna. I'm using raw sienna a lot because it's transparent. Uh, I think that this, this needs to be warmer though. So let's see here. I'm going to pull up your reference photo real quickly. Yeah, sure. Okay. So it's kind of a, it looks like a terracotta road. Yeah. Very, very New Mexico. I'm going to get a bigger brush here so we can go faster. Yeah. You got about five minutes left. All right. I'll finish this painting and um, I'll, shall I send post, you one? Shall I send post, Just uh, post it, post it in the comments when you're done. Okay. Um, there will be a lot of people who have questions and this uh, in the replays uh, we'll have many tens of thousands who will uh, be watching the replays. So okay. post, post it for later. Because this, the things in the bottom that I'm doing here uh, are really preliminary. I've added some cooler color to that. Now, I want one thing I do want to do is uh, lighten this as it goes into the distance. It's going to be lighter. It's going to be duller. I'm going to just try that sky gray, the warm sky gray and see if that will do it. Now. People are loving you, Peggy. Oh, that's good. I need all the love I can get. What kind, Yeah, we all do. What kind of brand of transparent oxide red do you use? I uh, use Rembrandt. Okay. Uh, because it's pretty runny. And yep. I use it primarily for uh, I want to get a dark in there. I use it primarily for underpainting, you know, for the darks. And and I like those to be fairly transparent. Okay. If you're watching on YouTube, it's not going to get posted on the YouTube comments. So if you want to get into the comments, go over to uh, Facebook. Just search Streamline Art Video on Facebook. And then uh, that's where she's going to post the image. It'll come across to everybody watching in the, most of the other platforms, but not all of them. You know, a couple of friends told me they were going to watch, and I told them heckling is allowed. What's allowed? Heckling. Are there any hecklers in there? Oh, hecklers. Yeah. No, there's no hecklers. But now that you mention it, I'm sure somebody will start heckling. Yeah. Can you, uh, Deborah asks, can you explain transparent versus opaque? Uh, hmm. You mean a definition? You mean in terms of the paints or? Well, I think the definition, what's the difference between transparent and opaque? One you can see through, the one, the other blocks things out. Yes. I'm using a paper towel now to, to mark the road, to lighten it. I like, one of the things I really like is for the white of the canvas to bounce back up through some parts of the painting. Yeah, I So like it. a transparent color allows that. An opaque color doesn't allow that. It covers up the canvas and you don't get that bounce of the white back through the paint. Stained glass is a good example. Yeah. It's, it's like that. Hello, Gerda in the Netherlands. Welcome. Now you're getting some hecklers. Oh, am I? Yeah. I'm going to put some of this. What kind of paper towels do you use? The cheapest ones because they're scratchy. Oh, okay. That's um, interesting. Because you want texture. Yeah. Um, Alex, thank you for the wonderful compliment. Said Streamline Art Video is the best thing to ever exist. That's very sweet of you. We work very hard at that. I thought it would be fun to get this at least one of these trees in. Okay, well you got two minutes and then I'm cutting you off. Okay. And then you're gonna come back on camera. 
Yeah, if you didn't, somebody who said they wish they joined earlier, there's a whole process where she explains the the uh, the stages of a painting and the and the various things you need to understand. It's worth worth seeing. Peggy's a great teacher. Oh, thanks, Eric. All right. Well, I've got a long ways to go with this. Well, you really you really nailed it though. It was really fabulous that you got that much done in that short a period of time. Why don't you come back on camera? Okay. So if you guys are watching for the first time, we're on here every day at 12 noon Eastern and also at 3 p.m. Uh, where we're giving instructional videos as well. Our guests at 12 noon are usually painting, sometimes different things. And today's guest is Peggy Emmel. So Peggy, come back on camera. There we go. There you we did go. a great job. Thank you so, so oh, much. Oh, thank you, Eric.